and um, here to talk about emotional safety, uh, psychological safety. Did any of you see the Google, the New York Times article about Google recently about that? So apparently Google researchers tried to figure out what the, what the thing is that a team has that's successful, a successful team has that the other teams don't have. And they couldn't figure out anything. They were stumped. They kept finding some teams act one way and other teams act a different way and that totally has no correlation whatsoever with what, whether they're an effective team. Whether they're outgoing or whether they're all business or it doesn't matter. If they go bowling, it doesn't matter. And they finally settled on uh, the realization that the difference between an, an, a high-functioning team and a not high-functioning team was psychological safety. So um, this is a time for us to talk about psychological safety, um, experience some questions about it, see what we can learn. Um, in my talks, typically people feel things. And occasionally one or two people walks out because feeling things is not what they came to do. So be advised, <laughs> if you are not here to feel things, there's a talk about Git, I think, going on right now. And you could learn <laughs> how to rescue your code, which is also really useful. Uh, OK. So, um, so you're all the brave folks who aren't scared to go to a talk with the word emotional in the title. All right. All right, we'll see. OK, so who here is a leader? I think half of you are lying. <laughs> That's my theory. Because um, to me, a leader is, is not someone who has a title. Because there are a lot of people with titles who are not leaders, um, or not effective leaders, or micromanagers, or whatever. And, and uh, I see a lot of people who are leaders who don't have titles because you care, because you influence your team, because what you care about seems to get noticed by other people, for example. If you come in in a bad mood, it has a different effect on the team than if somebody who's really quiet comes in in a bad mood, I'm guessing. So until proven otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're all leaders, and I'm pretty sure that I'm right. So um, when I was 19, a long, long time ago, I went to Lake Erie with a friend. And there are these breakers, giant rocks that go out into the lake to stop the waves, right? And um, maybe a pile of rocks is like, you know, it's definitely taller than me. I don't really know how tall because they go down into the water. But you're, you're on these giant rocks, right? And at 19, I'm, you know, right? And, and uh, I slipped on some water, moss, whatever. And I landed, boom on these sharp, terrifying rocks. And I look down, and I can see the water, and I can see sharp points. And I go, I could have died. And then I sit there for a good half an hour, unable to stand up, unable to walk back to shore, unable to get myself out of this predicament. Because I'm way out. There's a whole bunch of rocks between me and the beach. And I'm just like, uh, uh. <laughs> and the reason I tell you this, Two reasons. One is, everybody who knows anything about speaking will tell you you should start with a story. <laughs> <laughs> Which I usually don't, actually. But um, <laughs> fear does great things for us, right? It makes us vigilant. It makes us fast. It makes us like mm, protect ourselves. But it also paralyzes us. That's the whole point of that story. I'll stop there. So safety is sort of the opposite of fight or flight or freeze. Safety is being free of distraction of the form, I have to drop everything and protect myself right now. If I have that distraction, then I'm not able to engage. If I'm in an argument with a loved one and things get to the point where I feel like I have to protect myself at all costs, suddenly I'm not who I thought I was. I'm not who I wanted to be. I'm not listening. I'm not caring. I've just got this protective wall up. And I'm, I'm all punching people in the face. Not really, but you know, <laughs> figuratively. So safety to me is, is freedom from that distraction. It's the ability to pursue the things that you want to pursue. Creativity, problem solving, right? Like working together, 
those things. Before we go any farther, I would like to invite you to do a little brief mindfulness exercise. Any of you have seen me speak before, this is old hat. But the purpose of it is to get us all to a mindful and inquiring place. So it takes about three to five minutes. You can ignore me if you choose not to do it. Nobody will know because it's invisible. If you'd like to, you can close your eyes. And I would invite you to move your attention to your body. Notice the sensations in your hands, in your feet. Notice the feeling of gravity holding you to your chair. Do you notice any sounds around you? Voices maybe? Anything outdoors? What do you hear? Notice what you're hearing and then let it go. Are you feeling any smells? Are you smelling anything? Tasting your breakfast? Just notice and then let the awareness pass by. And without trying to change it, notice how your breath feels. How does it feel moving into your body and out? Is it rapid or shallow? deep into your belly. Just notice it. Don't try to fix it. And then gradually let yourself fall into a rhythm of long, slow breaths. Notice whether you have any thoughts coming up. Are they thoughts of things that happened earlier? Things that might happen later? And without dwelling on them, just notice those thoughts and let them pass by. Bring your attention back to your breath. Long, slow rhythm. And back to your body sensations. Without trying to fix it, notice whether your shoulders are relaxed or tense your jaw, notice your neck and your back. Notice the sensations, bring your attention back to your breath. Notice whether any emotions are coming up. and then whether the emotions are connected with body sensations. Let yourself linger on that question. And notice whether there are thoughts tied in with those emotions and sensations. Let the thought and the emotion together pass and bring your attention back to your breath. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and look around. Hi. <laughs> what was that like? Anybody have comments? Relaxing. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Sort of slows things down. Can I take you out of conference space for a second? The uh, I do that because um, <coughs> if I want my talk to have impact, it's going to be because you're paying attention to what's going on inside you. And so getting us to that place is really helpful. And it's helpful for me, too. I come in all uh, jitters and adrenaline, and I'm giving a talk now. Am I ready? Does the cord work? No, it didn't. Go get one, right? So um, now is where I ask you if you would like to pair up. So this exercise is for the next three minutes or so. Whoever's green 
as the I want to make sure I keep the people straight. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is green asks the other person this question. What helps you feel safe? And the rule is, hold on, start yet. The green person does not get to talk, except to ask for a clarified question. Or to say, uh-huh, or tell me more. Or you can ask the question again. If you get to a law, you can just ask again. So this is a time to listen and get to know the other person really well. Yeah? yeah. Go. Y'all just learned a facilitation technique, which is uh, this sort of putting your hand up and having other people put their hand up and eventually all the hands are up. If you haven't seen it before, you could try it. Um, so what, what did you learn? Did anybody learn anything? Uh, who can speak? Who's allowed to speak? Whoever wants to. I learned she's in quality assurance. <laughs> Did you find out what helps her feel safe? Yeah. She's supposed to be the green. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's really good to be a man in technology. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, no, there's anything wrong with being a woman. It's just better no, no. to be a man. No, if you want to feel safe. Better, it's just better to be a man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> that is not off topic, but let's stay on emotional safety and not physical safety, just yeah. noting that. Yeah? Are you asking greens or blues what we learned? I'm asking whoever learned something. Yeah? Um, well, my, my, uh, my blue person is um, uh, feels safe when um, you know, she's around people that uh, she feels comfortable with, when she knows her job, when she knows she can help people, uh, when she knows that she, you know some of the basics are taken care of, she feels financially safe, and has a nice home, and lives in a good place, and, and basically when she's not feeling threatened. Right, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a duh, but, <laughs> but, right. the, but those are the dimensions of it Yeah. that, that I learned. Does anybody else feel like those things help them feel safe? It's almost like we have those things in common, mm -hmm. human beings. Okay, yeah? Uh, I was just gonna say the fixation on the negative. Um, you know, is what I makes know, you... Any one, I don't know, any one individual, I mean, it's, it's more like a, a sigh of relief when, uh, when, when it's not on you. Oh, when someone else is getting the crap instead of you. Yeah. 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 That's interesting, thank you. <laughs> right, I mean, it, it sort of is safer. It's, 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 I think it's relative. So if you're yeah. in the environment, I think what it is, it's just like, oh, do I fight or think? I already know there's danger, but right now it's over there. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Communication makes you feel safer. Communication. Yeah. Feedback, yeah. Knowing what's going on with people. Yeah. That's a big one. Definitely, that came up. That's um, huge. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like the, having your base needs met first. Not being all of the center of attention. <laughs> yeah. A little uncomfortable. Not having that. Oh, right. Not being able to talk back. Right. That's a bit of vulnerability. Anybody else feel vulnerable during this exercise? <laughs> I'm guessing both sides, right? <laughs> like, because you're, you're like supposed to perform as a listener. What am I, what do I, what does that look like? Am I doing it right? Yeah. 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 The, the ultimate spectrum where you're being micromanaged, uh, looked at through a lens, you don't have that same type of feeling. So I thought empowerment was, um, 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 I can relate to that, uh -huh. and it's really powerful. So um, I think I'm hearing trust in there too, right? Being trusted. Absolutely, absolutely. It takes trust to empower others. 
Yeah. So one of the things that came up was um, comfort, right? We have um, the ability to sort of retreat back to comfort when we're feeling threatened. Comfort doesn't always help us grow or produce or create, um, but it's a form of safety that, you know, I thought of that when somebody was talking about, who said that thing about somebody else getting yelled at instead of you? I had you in the other chair and I was like, there is no other chair, okay. Um, so we go back to comfort, to recharge, to rest up, um, but not really to get shit done. And uh, so I, I want to talk about sort of that um, continuum between comfort and, and, and safety or danger. We don't want to feel threatened, right? And so we retreat into comfort. One of the effects of, hold on, my slide is weird, it's out of order. Oh, it's not out of order, it's just gradual, sorry. <laughs> we retreat into comfort when we feel more threat, right? The more threat there is, the more, right? And so what do we do? We don't speak up. We don't show up with our whole self, right? We don't feel empowered. We don't feel like we can really fully participate. And you've all seen it, right? On teams, you're in a circle and nobody's saying anything, right? And especially, who's a facilitator here? Anybody a scrum master or a coach or? And you're like, okay, get these people talking. <laughs> Talk, dang it! No, that doesn't work. <laughs> but the, the retreating is the thing that um, poisons teamwork. And that's what we're trying to get rid of when we try to create a culture of safety, right? By the way, does anybody know why I say cultivate safety instead of create? Everybody has to participate. It can't be something that you dictate. Boom! Okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> but yes, you cannot create safety for someone else. You can only reduce the amount of threat, maybe, or help them get to a safe place. So in the middle there, we have the project we want to do, the thing we want to create, the, the thing we want to tackle, the rocks we want to run on in the water, right? You can think of the red part as that distraction, that, that thing where all you can do is protect yourself. You have either your, you know, either you're in your house, and no one's around, right, in your bathroom, or you're terrified, if that's where you get your comfort. Or either you're drinking, <laughs> or you're terrified, right? And I, I you know, it's funny, but I, I know people and I love people who have that situation in their life, right? Their life is all anxiety except for when they're drinking. And then they've got people saying, what, stop drinking, you idiot! That helps. <laughs> either you're whatever, eating a, uh, eating a pizza, playing a video game, whatever it is you do, or the entire world is a threat. And so there is not a lot of room for creativity. You're not writing a symphony when you're in that state. You're not writing a computer program to do some miraculous things and take over the market or whatever, right? So we start to move that line, this line, who does graphic stuff? Anybody play with gradients? So this is the center of the gradient. Just slide it over. And we get to a place where we can do more things, right? We can take a walk in the park. We can, we can do fun things that are not drinking or <laughs> whatever it is that we do for the maximum comfort. For some of us, it's curl up in bed for a week, right? Um, Brian Wilson was in bed for a year. Is that right? So that's because there wasn't a lot of room over here for him. I assume, not being him, I don't know. So we move that line over by creating safety. And I have another story for you. So some years back, prior to some health issues and about 20 pounds ago, which is not much for me, I was plenty fat, I had some friends at work who went rock climbing and did some Googling just to make sure fat people could rock climb. And then I said, can I go? Rock climbing, I had a harness, I had a team member, 
at the other end of the rope, you know, they, any of you have not seen it, they stand like this and the, there's a rope and it's got you and so there's, there's a lot of tension and, you know, they know what they're doing. You have to be like certified to do that, it's called belaying. Um, I have rock climbed one time, so. Anyway, um, and I did it. And I did it because I had all of that safety so that I could stretch into something a little less comfortable, discomfort, right? Getting skilled at creating that safety opens up a whole world of things you can do. You could climb a rock wall, right? If you give yourself, <laughs> if you give yourself permission to create safety for yourself, you can friggin' do amazing things. And the same thing is true for a team. You create safety, you get rewards, huge rewards. No kidding, huge rewards. This is not like some subtle thing that like, oh, you know, we should probably make our stand-ups 14 minutes instead of 16 minutes or whatever. That's not what it is. <laughs> this is, this changes everything. You figure out how to honor that need for safety and you have space, open up, right? That green line just gets longer. So now when somebody says, hey, listen, I, kind of feeling uncomfortable about what happened this morning. Where does that fall on the line? If you've cultivated safety, it could fall here instead of here, right? And have you been on a team where saying that would be here? And so you don't say it. You don't say anything. Like, and you just watch the productivity. Like, you guys know this. You came to a talk with emotional in the title. You've watched it happen, right? You watch the, if you think of that as a graph of velocity or productivity or creating a beautiful app, right? It just gets <laughs> You don't get that. You don't get the beautiful work unless you have the space. And the space is what you're creating. Space to not be doing nothing but self-protection. So growth and learning and creativity, all of that stuff happens in that space. And that's what we're trying to create. So if you could pair up again and switch roles. And this time, are you too new? Yes. <laughs> you could be a pair. It all depends. I'll describe the rules again. So the questioner is not supposed to talk except to ask clarification and to ask the question again because you're trying to get to know the other person really well. You want to understand something about them. So this, this time the question is, what situations make it hard to feel emotionally, psychologically safe? What gets in the way? Um, Carl Rogers was a psychologist in uh, the mid 20th century who sort of turned psychology upside down. He began thinking of um, people who, who needed help as clients instead of patients. And his job, as he saw it, was to help people live better, help people resolve problems. And uh, he saw them as equals and not as people he should fix. So that was a big, big transformation in the field. Um, and he came up with, from his experience working with people, three things that have to happen for someone to be in an effective therapeutic relationship. And the reason I bring this up is because, to me, a therapeutic relationship is a relationship where I'm growing, where I'm fully able to become myself, be myself. It's not someone fixing me, but it's sort of how I want all my relationships to be. Um, and more importantly, I think that what he was describing was psychological safety the thing you need in order to be able to show up and grow and become who you can become, right? We can't all become everything. I'm not going to become Stephen Hawking in my re remaining years, but I can become me, right? And so if that's what psychological safety is, then I, I want to talk about the, the three conditions. I think they're really important. The first one is that the other person or people are showing congruence. They're real. They're in alignment. They're not phony. That's really a big one. Not phony. The second one is empathy. And empathy is 
the setting aside of judgment and relating to what the person is going through, what things look like from their perspective. And this isn't a talk about empathy, but I will point back to one thing, which was, um, oh, wow. Some, somebody said something over here, and I was going to draw attention to it, and then it just left me. What was it? No? Oh, it was when I said, does anybody else feel that way? Does anybody else feel safe for the same reasons this person feels safe? And the reason I brought that up then was because um, if you go on a quest to become super empathetic, the thing that's going to really help you is realizing that everybody is experiencing the same needs you are in the end. They may have strategies you really don't like, right? But their, their underlying needs are the same as yours. And if you can get to that, then you can meet somebody with empathy. So the second one was empathy. And the last one he called unconditional positive regard, which basically means unconditional love in the context of that relationship or in the context of those conversations, which is really, really challenging. But I think of it as fondness. And people will talk about, do we have to like each other for the team to work? Well, you don't have to go to church together. You don't have to, you know, play golf together. You don't have to go to gay bars together on the weekend. <laughs> but um, lack of fondness is judgment, right? It's like, well, I'll talk to you during the day, but I know you're an asshole, right? Like, that's not, <laughs> that's not safety. And so the thing is, here's the thing, right? I have this little short 45 minute section session to tell you this one thing, which is that if you can't find fondness, the other person's not going to be safe. Which means, which means, if you believe that, and I'm seeing people nod, you've got to figure it out. You've got to go out there and figure out how to have enough empathy that you can have fondness for every single one of those mofos that you work with. <laughs> I'm, that is actually how it is. And you know, nobody wants to deal with that because that's really, really scary, right? Like that is your own heart has to change. And then if you're going to spread this throughout your team, somehow you get to influence your team to figure out that they have to have that same fondness for their teammates if we're going to have safety. That's a big thing, right? So, I mean, I'm sending you out of here with homework is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got left. Hmm. Okay, we touched on this a little tiny bit, that you can't create safety for someone. You can only sort of help to cultivate it because everybody's got their own stuff, right? When I was in college, that was the first time I heard of triggers. And back then, what I understood them to mean was, there are things that will raise up emotion in me, right? If you're my mom, you don't have to say hardly anything. <laughs> and, you know, it, it depends on who you are and what you say. You can call me fat all day long. I'd be like, yep, and then that's fine. There's, if you call me authoritarian, then I'm going to be like, <sighs> <sighs> right? So that's a trigger for me. Apparently Donald Trump is cool with being called authoritarian. I hear. I don't know anything about him. Um, my point is, triggers are very personal. They're your own stuff. And trigger warnings are just like, hey, you know, I know a lot of people are upset by this thing, so I thought I'd give you a heads up. Do you have the resiliency to deal with it right now or not? It's up to you. Like, it's, it's not about somebody else owning the cause. And so that's, it's like that you can't create someone else's safety. You can't. There's people who can't leave their house without being in a panic. Nothing you can do to make a team where they're going to feel safe. Right? So you just have to figure out who you want to be and then be that trying to get through that quick because I have three minutes. <laughs> oh, my notes say seven slides to go. That's what it says right here. <laughs> That's nice. Anybody not read this before? Tell the truth. Okay, then I won't skip it. That's, thank you for telling me. Um, some time ago, a, an agile coach practitioner named Norm Kurth created this uh, 
that's going to be nice. I'm taping myself, to, and I just fondled the mic. I do that. But you don't have to hear it because there's no amplification. Norm Kurth created this retrospective prime directive as a way to start a retrospective in the hopes of creating a more safe environment. And I will read it to you because reading slides is annoying. It says, regardless of whatever we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and ability, the resources available and the situation at hand. Does anybody else find that sort of difficult to believe? A little bit? Yeah, one thing I have learned, like is sometimes it's helpful and sometimes I get, no, they didn't do the best they could. <laughs> What are you talking about? Why? Uh, yeah, I can fake it. OK. So um, I'm going to tell you what, uh, what I actually think in my life that helps me get to empathy and openness and non-judgment. And this is something you can try on. You can experiment with it, and you can see how it changes your life, or whether it does, or whether it makes you more happy or less happy. What if every person you meet is doing the best they can to meet needs you can understand and recognize in yourself, even when their strategies are not to your liking? So I'm not saying they are or aren't, because that would require magic on my part. But I can say that I can see people this way, and it breaks down barriers. Any thoughts? I'll just leave that there. So this is the section in the last uh, negative 30 seconds <laughs> that we have left, or do not have left, uh, where I talk about specific things you can do. This one is just tell it. Own it, right? You care about compassion. Other people care about compassion. I found that out when I stopped. Uh, I sort of gave myself permission to make my whole life about compassion. And I found out other people, like people showed up for that. You're all standing right, right? And I was like, oh, you can't talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about that. We have to talk about story points. No, it's actually not true. <laughs> Don't have to talk about Haskell, right? So tell it like it is. And I'll say that um, one thing I have had really good luck with as a facilitator is saying something like, well, we want to make sure everybody's heard, right? And people are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm a little worried that we're not treating each other with kindness. I go, oh, you can just say that? Yes, you can. You can just say it. It's cool. So I'm going to say that um, I think that's all the advice I have for you. <laughs> uh, I wrote a book which you can't get here because it's only electronic, but you can get a card off that table that will tell you about it. And um, it's the second 45 minutes of this talk. So if you're interested, you should check it out. Thank you.